Greetings everyone and welcome into the PCB webinar. My name is Gzim and I am the account manager for security portfolio at PCB. Today I will be as an organizer of this webinar and I hope we will have an interactive webinar with all questions and your comments. For your information, I assume you all know that PCB organizes daily webinars in our five portfolios and every week we organize a webinar on a security portfolio covering different topics and areas. In this uh, webinar, we will hear about the topic exploring payment platforms, ISO 20022 and ISO uh, 8583. This webinar will be presented from PCB partner and trainer Mr. Orlando Olmide Odeide. Mr. Odeide is PCB certified trainer. He is an experienced enterprise architect and program director working on various technology solutions. His expertise spans to various ISO standards such as ISO 27001, 20000, 22301, COBIT, CMMI, TOGAF, PRINCE2, ITI. We hope this webinar helps you understand the importance of payment platforms and related standards. If you have any question, you can write them at any time in your question box in right hand control panel or you can use the option to raise your hand and we will answer to all of them accordingly. Please, Orlando, you may continue. Okay. Uh, hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me properly. My name is Orlando and I will be taking this webinar where we're going to be looking at two different standards that are used for, uh, that are used for measuring the should I say accuracy, correctness, and uh, how standardized the uh, payment platforms that organizations are using. So we'll be exploring um, 20,000 and 22 and 8583. Um, these are two great uh, standards that a lot of organizations, international organizations actually use. So we'll look at what each of them have to offer and we'll look at what exactly um, should an organization, whether it's a financial services company or it's a bank, that will be looking to uh, standardize based on one of these stand uh, one of these standards. Which of them should they be looking at? Should they be looking at 20,000 and 22, or should they be looking at 8583? What are the what are the advantages of each of these platforms? So that's primarily what we'll be looking at today. Okay, so uh, let us start by talking about financial transaction messaging, which is called FTM. Um, these days, you really cannot do any business, especially using a card, using an ATM, using a point of a point of sale system without without a card. So, on the card, usually you have something called the primary account number, which is validated um, across the network, right? And sometimes this uh, primary account network, um, the primary account number is aligned to the credit card number. So, of course, you have some transactions that you can do using a card and you have some transactions that you can do not using a, a card as it is. So, it really does depend. But our focus really is looking at um, financial transactions as a whole, whether you're using a card, whether you're not using a card, and um, how exactly do we go around um, ensuring that we follow through with uh, these standards as it is. Countries and regulators usually end up using one of these standards. Um, a lot of organizations, especially if you do MasterCard, if you do Visa card, you will typically end up using one or both of these standards. So I know that 8583 is very common, um, but also what I consider to be a more current and updated version of using 8583 is the 20,022 that uses uh, XML in itself. I put a, a little snippet in here so that people understand what, uh, or people will remind themselves of what debits and credit transactions uh, are. So the standards are very important because if you don't have the standards, I've, I've run into organizations that, you know, have developed one payment platform or the other, and uh, when it came to integrating with uh, others, they ju it just didn't work. And that was because in doing their uh, development, they didn't take any of these standards into consideration. They did not align to any of this. So at the end of the day, when they now came to the integration part, it was like an afterthought. So they then came to the integration part and they found out that, oh, they should have aligned to one of those standards at the very beginning. And that's what it is that we're looking at, and that's what it is that we need to ensure that we can avoid as, uh, as professionals uh, uh, working in the industry. So 
two key things that you need to remember. Uh, ISO 8583 uses data elements, uh, uses bitmaps, and um, 20,022 uses XML. Uh, most people who do any kind of web services work, any kind of integration work these days, literally focus on, on using XML and getting a lot of those things done. But nevertheless, as of today, Visa Card, MasterCard, a lot of them still use 8583. So, if you're going to be working with international organizations, working with other banks, working with the regulator in your own country, this is a conversation you really want to have with them to know which of these standards have they adopted. And if they haven't adopted any of these standards, of course there are loads of other standards that they could have adopted, but typically most people pick one of these two. Just so that your own internal development work does not go to waste um, uh, as it is. All right. So let's first look at 8583 and um, uh, the interchange uh, message specification, uh, especially for payment cards, and it's broken down into three parts. Um, the messages, uh, the data elements and code values, right, which we call the MTI, the message type indicator, the application and registration procedures for the institution uh, identification codes, which is the second bit of it, IIC, and then the final one is the maintenance and procedures for messages and data elements, um, which is the, the fields of the message in itself. So 8583, this is how it works, which is what I'll say significantly <laughs> different from how 20,022 works, which it just follows a particular XML code and it consumes how it, uh, how it operates. Nevertheless, as I said, this is what a lot of people do. So these things just have to be taken into consideration. If you've ever done development or you've ever worked in any kind of payment platform industry, we will go through how typically a lot of people use this and we will hopefully see how you can also learn from it. Okay? Uh, so this is the structure of the standard in itself. So I, I have a copy of my, I have my copy of the standard and this is exactly what it goes through. It starts with the symbol the terms, the message structure, the data elements. Uh, then it gives you the message and the classes and the transaction matching, registration on the, with, the, with the management group and the, the guidance on how to actually get this done. Then it gave, it's got quite a bit of annexure in terms of uh, code listings, data elements, and how literally it should be done. Uh, when we hold training classes for clients exploring this, especially people who are building one payment platform or the other, we spend quite a bit just exploring the content of, of the standard in itself because it's very clear in terms of its specification. And once you deviate from this, it literally does not work. Uh, people have decided to deviate from it in other times and then they spend a lot of time testing and debugging the application. So it's very important that you actually ensure that, that this works and that this works uh, adequately, that you follow through with the standard. Also, if you're going to get an external auditor to come to look at it, they will follow through with the standard. They will check literally how your headers have been defined, how you use the data elements, the coding that you're using. You've got to follow through with it completely. Okay? So, this is great. Um, it, 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 8583 has been used for a while. I mean, I think this, uh, the latest iteration should be the third uh, iteration of it. And uh, basically, it just tells you how to or pack certain data fields and how to literally reliable, reliably unpack them, right? Especially going across uh, issuing houses, going across transaction merchants, and going across the entire value chain. So it does really help in ensuring that, you know, that the electronic system that you've got, that it works, that it works um, adequately. The electronic transaction system that you have, that it works and it works the, uh, adequately. So it looks at the data fields and how this is going to be transmitted across the entire network. Uh, it will go through some kind of other system that I mentioned. Uh, some of them are just transaction and um, the TPS system that it's got to go through. So um, it's easy. It's not difficult once you get it right initially. And uh, it doesn't necessarily, you, you can inculcate some elements of uh, L, uh, XML in it, but it doesn't have any requirement for that. It really just has a requirement for you to define the format to find the messages and uh, to then decide to look at the, the, the codes in themselves and what it is that they interpret. It's quite straightforward 
uh, in terms of how it's been defined, especially if you can lay your hands on the standard in itself. So, um, yes, that, I mean, that's it, really. Uh, there are different ways by which you can do this. And um, some people have come up with other ways. There are loads of alternative ways by which you can do this. The challenge always is the fact that when you do it in an alternative way, will be transaction processing systems and all the secondary and tertiary providers that you're going to be working with, will they recognize what it is that you have done? How did you recognize the or in your code? How did you recognize the card number, the amount, the currency, the merchant ID? How exactly is that done? So if you come up with a new way that is just completely or uniquely yours, you will, complete, you will struggle to communicate with others using that approach. And that is why it's great to actually follow through with one of these standards, either the 8583 or the other one that we'll be talking about in a short while. So just think about an ATM and think about the fact that you can put your slot your card into the ATM and you can punch a couple of numbers and it is processed and you literally can withdraw money from it. Of course, you can carry out other transactions that are not necessarily withdrawn. So you can check your account balance, you can even do loads of other things. So anybody, so whether you're working for a telecommunications provider, you're working for a payment uh, processing company, you will need to take this into consideration as you run or as you scale your business. All right, um, the transaction data contains various information, the account number, the terminal, the transaction in itself, and other related data that will be useful. So that's why when you and I put the card into the ATM, it reads off the card, it automatically inter interprets them, the, we issued it, uh, um, it links it to a certain bank account in a certain country, and then it processes it. And then, of course, it can decline the transaction, it can generate a, a response message, and um, all this can be delivered back to the terminal within the predefined uh, period of time. So this is just, I mean, typical. This is, the, this, is, this is what happens behind. There's a huge opportunity for auditors in this area because a lot of organizations need to provide, um, they need to provide comfort to their stakeholders that the way that they have defined their payment platforms and the way it's been coded and the way it's been encoded onto a particular card or the other has taken into consideration or is very much in alignment with the particular standard. So this is really important. Okay? So um, once again, it just defines the communication flow between different systems so that um, the, the transactions can be carried out. And you've got various requests and you've got uh, uh, responses. Uh, the, this is the area of electronic funds transfer and uh, uh, um, uh, point of sale system. So as these transactions are made with the customer, they use their cards, it goes through MasterCard or Visa card networks, which usually uh, the card is aligned to one or both of them, and um, it goes through the processing that we're describing, right? 8583 does not carry any routing information, so it try, uses the, um, uh, the transmission protocol data unit in itself, the header for that, to be able to do the interpretation because it doesn't carry out any information in itself. I've got, a, I've got a diagram up front that will really clarify what that looks like. Uh, once again, um, 8583 defines a common standard. Um, it's not typically used by systems or network. It's basically used for transaction or payment processing. It defines, obviously, as, as I mentioned, the data elements which remain the same in the system. So these fields are used by each of the network to adapt the standard and the transaction to its own uh, custom fields and for their own custom use. And that's why you've got to follow through with this particular standard. It hasn't been updated in a while. That's actually because a lot of people are actually using the 20,022 instead of the 8583. So that's why you will see that the last version of this is a 2003 version, which is a about a 13-year-old um, a version of the document. But most people are really, also the organization ISO 20002 org, and of which they are they're in alliance with the SWIFT uh, network, they're very much pushing that particular standard. So you really might want to consider, but in my country, 8583 is the, is the regulatory standard for banks that are doing processing. So they're measured against 8583, which is also what it is that happens in a lot of places. So this is one, this is one slide that you really want to take in.
you really want to take this in because this is as much as what you need to take into consideration when you're building your own applications that will consume information, that will consume data, and that you will that will be doing the transaction processing. These three these three uh, um, uh, areas: the message type identifier, the bitmaps, and the data elements. Literally, okay. The first two digits of the message type identifier. So you can see financial transaction messages O2. Reversal messages O for network uh, management messages. Hence why it is important for organizations to stick with the standard. If you don't stick with the standard, all this is completely badly misinterpreted and you literally have to write the application again. I've seen organizations that have failed at this and that's why I'm very pedantic about this. So the message is a four digit numeric field and describes each message, the class and its function. And these are some of the regular ones. Okay, so look at this normal transaction message flow. It's good that you understand this so that you look at the arrow as it's going out from system A, send request, process the request, and um, response message, receive response transaction is finished. Okay, once again, it's got to follow through with this. It must follow through with the nomenclature, with the naming convention, with the way the, the numbers have the, and the messages are defined. Okay, it starts with 0200 from the requester and the responder will send the one to 0210. You just have to code this into the application. But if you compare it with this, which is for the reversal message flow, okay, so a reversal message request, it's followed through with 0400, this, it's processed and the response is sent as 0410. Once again, all these you just need to take into account. Non-monetary messages are messages that you can easily use this, so like exactly where you're checking your balance. When you're checking your balance, and when you're also doing, so these days even when you go to some ATMs, you can see that you can recharge your, your utility bills from the ATM. They've taken these same things into consideration in building those payment processing applications. All right, so um, I'll just go into some little explanation here. I will not bore you too much because I don't want to uh, take too much of your afternoon on this uh, webinar. So reversal message is identified as I, as I explained by the header and for interactive with uh, the, the identifier is this. And for you to go back with the response it will use 0401. Um, uh, an example when the reversal message is being sent out is when the previous successful financial transaction is being voided at credit card terminal. So people who are seated internally within a the bank they usually do the vo they void certain transactions or they reverse it and that's why you can see that sometimes if you've been charged uh, wrongly it takes a while sometimes it takes 12 hours sometimes it takes 12 or 24 hours and the transaction in itself is um, is reversed and it uses codes to be able to do that it must follow through with the code specification uh, for you to be able to get that done all right so um, and of course you've got the auto reversal messages uh, which are automatic, which are automatic, and sometimes you can see that the the reversals are instant. If you use your card and use it at once, and um, the it probably wrongly credit, uh, uh, it wrongly debited you, it can literally just reverse the the transaction. So uh, when a reversal message does not receive a response in time, uh, to re to repeat the sending previous reversal, and this called they repeat. So with this, it's completely programmed into the application and it's, it's automatic, right? So you use 0421 for non-interactive uh, transactions of sorts. All right, so once again, um, uh, the next one we'll look at is uh, 0800 messages um, or network ma management messages. And these ones are not necessarily transaction based uh, to control the interchange network for supporting the describing system condition. So sometimes, once again, if you go to an ATM, it sends a particular message onto the screen and that is what it's using. It's using the 0800 to be able to do that. So you have cutoff and echo messages and it's been defined. These specifications are actually very clear in the standard. So I enjoin you all to please buy the standard, look at the standard properly, give it to your developers, give it to the guys who are working on the payment side and uh, make a decision. Once again, you need to be aware of what the regulator has put in place. So for the people who don't have um, 
who struggle with anything wants to see binary or when they see bits uh, as it is in here. If you remember in this diagram, uh, let me quickly put this up, you talk about the message type identifier, the bitmaps, and the data element. So we'll look at the bitmaps before we look at the data element in itself. And um, a single the, the bitmap consists of uh, 64 or 16 hexadecimal correct positions. And literally, this, this just follows, uh, it follows 1 to 64, and the secondary bitmap uses 65 to, uh, to 128. And literally, each of them has got to be aligned. Right? Most commonly used data elements are usually represented in the primary bitmap. Okay, so you have your on state, you've got your off state, and then of course sometimes it's represented in hexadecimal. Now, a lot of these things are shielded from the users, and that's why when you get these messages, sometimes they don't come as this onto your phone because this will be meaningless on your own side. So let's look at the, I mean, uh, people who study computer science or who are very comfortable doing any kind of binary conversion will understand this hexadecimal character to bitmap uh, uh, representation. So people are very familiar with this. And this is standard. So if you're build, using hexadecimal, it's got to correspond to the bitmap representation. It should, should clearly correspond to bit, bitmap uh, uh, as it is. So if a bit is set on, um, then of course it's got a value of 1. And when it is off, it's got a value of uh, 0. So the first bit of the primary map signifies if the secondary bit is present or, or not. So I'll show you this example now. So if you look at this, right? So you can see the primary bitmap and you can see the, the secondary bitmap, right? And you can see the direct translation from the primary bitmap to the secondary bitmap, whether you're doing it following a hexadecimal or just a normal bitmap. And um, it's just a direct conversion based on the based on the table, right? So secondary bitmap is present when the bitmap position is on. So as I, as I mentioned earlier. So yeah, that, that, that really is how, it, is how it works. Some people only do hexadecimal and some people use the bitmap. But the secondary bitmap is present when the bitmap position. So if you look at the first bit, um, uh, when you have one, then you get zero. Then you have one, then you get zero. And when you have one, then of course it also shows up as one in there. All right. So the final part. Once again, I will take you back to this slide if you don't mind. Um, message type identifier, the bitmap, and the data element. All these are coded into the message. So we're just going to go to the data element. So 128 unit bit from the data element defined here. Uh, the, 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 in the standard, all these things have been clearly defined. So when you see LLV uh, variable, LLV variable, uh, mean the length of the variable that follows. So LLV LL means zero to zero zero to nine nine. While the three, triple L VAR means the length can be as much as a uh, uh, nine nine nine. So double L nine nine, triple L nine nine nine. Right. This once again is is what you need to know to be able to get this uh, the standard um, to implement this within your payment platform. This is a great table, so it's good that you also understand it. And these are an extract directly from the standard. So you can look at the bits, uh, the description, the format, and they will have certain attributes. So people who write applications need to take these attributes into, into consideration. All right, so the, the sample messages that are put in here, it will make a lot of sense to a lot of people. But well, these are the messages that are generated from uh, when you've implemented 85 with 83 standards. So I put an example of an ISO network management message, the, the message response, the financial transaction message, the transaction message response. And um, I have a couple of others, reversal message and re response for reversal message. So um, this is great stuff. Um, it's really important, once again, that you have a look at this, that you understand how it works that you need to study the standard, probably go for some extensive training on how to interpret the standard and how to use the standard. Uh, Visa card, MasterCard, and a lot of international organizations as of today, they still use 8583. And a lot of regulators still insist that a lot of financial institutions, especially banks, still continue to use 8583 as of today. So it's not an unimportant uh, standard. It's not a standard that you should throw away or put aside. And some developers uh, actually prefer this because of their own development approach. And uh, get people will still write a lot in um, 
the native uh, C++ and some of those other languages. But most, most new people now just focus on the ISO 20022. That is what a lot of people are doing. And it's really simple why that is. It is simply because of, um, of UML. XML, UML works. Everybody likes XML. Everybody, everything that everybody is doing in the world of today is XML based. XML is not difficult programming. It's not. It's literally just understanding the construct and being able to do it. It's also modern because you can do all your specification in UML, draw up the diagrams, draw up the interactions, and then you give it to the developers and they can automatically interpret what it is that you put in and generate the codes, the actually applications that you can use that will generate XML codes for you directly from your UML models. So it really does simplify life and makes things easy. It brings upon, uh, it brings the entire concept of reuse, it brings it into consideration. And the organizations that are supporting this are really doing well. So they're doing well in publicizing it and in ensuring that, you know, organizations are junking how uh, using the use of other standards and, um, and they're just following through with uh, um, uh, 20,022 uh, as it is. It's got some older names, but it's got wide adoption. So, because if I had my if I had my choice, I would definitely go with this. Once again, just in comparison with the way 8583 is, it's got its own document also. So, if you look at these documents in terms of how you know the overall methodology, rules, and responsibilities, it's got some clear guidelines to how you do the modeling. So, that that is why people who are not modern day developers, because modern day um, so, um, a lot of people in the olden days who used to do development don't do a lot of modeling. It's the new guys who end up doing a lot of modeling, especially in UML, and using specific tools to do that. Before we then generate the design rules using XML, before we then build the entire code snippet all out in XML. It allows for reuse. It allows for easy fix. It allows for easy troubleshooting and easy debugging. And then, so, it shows you how you want, how you can do reverse engineering, one of the other documents, and finally how you can um, do the message transport uh, characteristics. So yeah, this is how this is how it works. All right. So so let let's dig deep into 2022. Um, it's a recipe for making financial messaging standards. So they they I mean they comp they're always developing documents. It's an agreed methodology used by a lot of financial institutions and it uses separate layers. So these are the three layers. In comparison to the three layers that 8583 uses, now this focuses on business processes and concepts so that you're seated with the business users, you're not taking it as a business as usual, you're seated with them agreeing on what exactly it is that they want to represent before you then look at the logical messages and the models that are behind that, before you then look at the syntax. See, this is brilliant. I mean, if you've been doing the hard work of 8583, then you really need to explore 20,022 because it really does make life easy in getting this done. So um, one of the key characteristics of ISO uh, the, 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 the 2022 is that is, is the distinct separation that we talked about, the definition of the processes, looking at the roles, looking at the actors. It follows what we call, uh, it also uses the notation for business process modeling notation, BPMN. So it follows through with that. So then the, um, the business information is arranged into business components using various elements as it is. All right. Uh, I've talked about UML, so you can using this example you can drop. I'll expect everybody you can just pick a pen right now and you can drop this UML representation. Well, um, when looking at the process involved in the credit transfer, the money receiver, you can drop the actor, you can drop the action. You can say, you know, then the debtor, the agent, the bank of the debtor, right, in between, then the creditor, the money receiver, then the debtor agent, the bank of the debtor, and the creditor agent. So you can model this um, and, um, and get this done on paper. And you can present this to the business user and tell them this is exactly how you're going to do it. So you can, this is not the, this is not the sample that relates directly to this. It's just a sample to tell you that you can represent it in simple diagrams that look like this. And um, it makes sense. It makes sense. It doesn't hide anything. It doesn't make it bring it into ambiguous language. 
it doesn't confuse anybody with regards to what it is. So um, twenty thousand uh, uh, looks at looks at it from these three layers, from the business process side to the logical side, right? So the logical message, the description of all the information that I needed to perform a specific business activity independent of the syntax. It's also composed of message components uh, in some kind of hierarchical structure. The message component contains one or more message elements and derived from a business component. So it follows through. You actually can't get the second layer done except you get the first layer done. So if I go back here, you've got to do it in these three layers. The key, the business process and concept, the middle layer, the logical message, and the bottom layer. You, it's got to follow through uh, hierarchically that way for it to make sense. I already mentioned reuse. So I said one of the things that is great is that it's easy even for non-developers to look at it and say, why isn't this thing working? It also uses naming and language conventions that, that are almost like you know what you and I will say. So if you look at the last bullet point here, so interbank settlement amount, uh, interbank settlement date. Those are very clear things that you can use and you can reuse because there's no, there's no ambiguity. Business users understand this language. Comparison to bitmaps and the hexadecimals that we were talking about. So um, what's always the challenge for a lot of people? It's always an issue of syntax and semantics. Really, that's always what it always comes down to. Um, Business model and logical layer are two of these layers, and of course, the syntax is the physical representation of this. It uses XML and the, as a primary syntax, and that makes life easy because XML is already global, right? So we can convert existing messages to XML format, and it can be interpreted. Um, uh, so, but of course, some people use proprietary systems. Some people use others that are not easily uh, converted, but then you can also get the developers to convert those messages into XML format, and you can align it to uh, 20,022. Uh, um, as we said before, financial institutions, I just brought this in as a reminder, especially for people who have come in late, they exchange massive amounts of information with their customers amongst themselves. Um, this only works when the, uh, there's a common language and there's a common understanding, especially if we're using various computers and networks to get this done. So. I brought this back as a reminder of what it is that we're talking about. We're really talking about the messaging that happens uh, between financial institutions. All that stuff that people talk about middleware. And some people write points to point uh, web services on XML. Uh, and some people have deployed the uh, service oriented architecture to ensure that this works. So once again, semantic uh, syntax versus semantics. So um, we don't really want a lot of human interaction, especially in the interpretation of the of the of the of the of the information. So, the the message uh, you have message definition. So there are agreements with regards to the use of uh, the syntax, which is the format, and the meaning once you use that particular format. So it's very clear to everybody what it is that you're trying to say. So let's look below. Message standards provide clear definitions of information. For example, interbank settlement currency U.S. dollar twelve thousand five hundred interbank settlement amount. It's, it makes sense. It's easily read. It's easily interpreted. And if you need to do any kind of troubleshooting, you can easily get to this. Uh, of course, some of you will say, well, Lando, you're arguing on behalf of uh, 20,022. It's because you can see the difference between when I was talking about how the messages are related when we're talking about uh, 8583, ISO 8583, and now that we're talking about uh, 20,022. All right? So, a lot of financial institutions are doing this. And if you're going to present this to your own organization, if you're going to talk about it within your business, and people are going to say, why are you pushing for this? Why are you saying this? Tell them it's because it uses UML and XML, and that it makes life easy. And it gives a common syntax and semantics. Once you use the syntax, then the semantics is clearly understood by the other person on the other side. So uh, if you see into bank settlement amount, it means only one thing. Right within the context. So yeah, to avoid repeating myself, this is just more detail in terms of what it is that I've been saying for the past uh, almost 30, 35 minutes. Talking about definition, talking about dates, talking about amount, talking about currency. When you teach people XML, people don't believe how easy or straightforward it is for them to actually pick up something like XML. 
in their mind it's something that only developers do. But I can guarantee you business users actually also look at XML. And it really does make things uh, easy for everyone. Uh, good. So reuse, 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 reuse. Um, XML is also quite agile in its approach, and the entire world only talks about agile these days. So there's agile, we're even talking about how we're going to make ISO implementations actually very agile. So do using 20,022 is agile. It's agile, it's got reuse capability built into it, and it allows for, should I say, standard interpretation. All right. So the syntax, so you, 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 um, uh, the, the syntax is, clear, is quite clear, uh, only except to the one people who use uh, uh, standards that are proprietary to their own organization. One of the great things about using 20,000 and 22 is also the repository. So um, the dictionary, it's got like a repository. And if you've done anything around Toga and Enterprise Architecture, it also talks about the, the same type of repository. So where it's got like a dictionary list of meanings and uh, you can get clear meanings to different things directly from there. So if in case you're not certain what something means or what, how it should be interpreted, you can get it directly from there. So um, uh, ISO 20,022 is um, whenever a message that reads debtor agent, it is clear what it means. Right? Financial institution identification, it is clear what that means. Debtor agent, it's also very clear what it means. So this repository holds hundreds of business components, 700 message components, and more than 250 definitions. So it's great. This is something that, you know, um, we'll be exploring with PCB in the very near future, I'm looking at holding specific training classes that address how organizations can adopt this and possibly some form of, uh, of certification that is going to be built around this in the, in the years to come, some possible collaboration between PCB and the organization that is behind this particular uh, standard. All right, so let me round up here. So what makes 2022 great? Um, well-structured financial messages um, and a way to unify the various standards. So you can actually start off using 8583 and bring that entire thing and render it in, in, in XML. Uh, that can be done. You can bring what you used to do there and bring it into, into XML. Um, it it um, uses a logical message and there's a direct mapping. There's even a document that I have that maps 8583 and how you can turn it into 20,000. So Interoperability is the key word here. You want to make sure that you use something that is global, that irrespective of what payment platforms we're looking at, what it is that you've done will work with it. And that's, that's, that's important. So you can't take away into the words called integration, the word interoperability, you can't take it away from this. All right, so as a roundup, um, the key advantages of 2022, linking messages to business processes, uh, really using components and um, using XML as it is. So thank you very much. I mean, um, I didn't want this to be a very long webinar. I wanted it to be quick. I wanted it to be sharp. And uh, we've explored from the beginning, if I just can take you back one second, 85, 83. And this is probably the most important slide that you need to understand. This slide that talks about 85, 83 and how it works and how you do message type identifiers, meet maps, and data elements and how you can map this directly to 20,000. So it's really you about using this particular format in comparison to using XML format, UML and XML format, which is exactly what it is that um, uh, ISO 20,022 uh, uses. So I hope you gained a lot from this. Uh, you will need to obviously explore this in more detail. It can get very technical, and I know that not everybody in the audience uh, Come from a technical background, some of them are from a business background. Uh, this is one of the things you really want to speak to the financial services companies that you're working with. You want to talk to the banks, you want to talk to some of those organizations and say, can I do some kind of audit for you with regards to your payment platforms and if your development and your updates and the things you're doing are very much in line with the various standards that exist. You also need to find out what the regulator is saying in each of your countries and how this is going to apply directly. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Orlando. We have a few questions, and uh, one comes from attendee 
who didn't, did not catch the whole uh, webinar, so he wants to know about the, what is the security advantage of the updated ISO 20022 standard. All right. I mean, so like everything that is XML, so um, the security is, all, is also clearly defined. And if you, if you can remember, I was showing you the, the entire specification of the document. So uh, where's the slide? So you've got to look at these, uh, these specifications. So how the design rules already takes into, control, into consideration all the controls that need to be in there. All the controls in terms of headers, in terms of trailers, in terms of the footers, in terms of the message definition, in terms of how you're going to do reverse engineering, even how the encryption is going to be done, all that is adequately specified in the document. So you can see here, there are like six different parts to the document. So it's a huge document that you will need to familiarize, a huge set of documents that you will need to familiarize yourself with. But yes, adequately the security elements have been adequately taken into consideration. Okay, we have another question. It's, uh, can all institutions adopt ISO 20022 or do they have to implement special technology? No, no, no. no. Anybody can do 20,022 uh, because, um, as I said, it uses XML. And XML is an international standard. So once your web services are being developed very much in line with XML, you're all literally already in line uh, with 20,022. But you will still need to then get the standard so that the specifics of the interpretation and the meaning of each of those things, you've also used them. But XML is the basis for getting this done. Right, so anybody can do it. It doesn't even matter whether they started out using other standards like 8583 or other proprietary ones. Anybody can convert to 20,022. Um, 20, uh, so the question, another question is pretty related to this one. It's uh, the security comes as an inheritance of XML uh, standard or is one of the standards actually discusses uh, security? Both, both, both ways. So first and foremost, uh, you, you utilize the, the typical um, security elements that come with XML. But once again, the design rules here, you've got to specify. Can you see part four? So if you look at this slide that is on, part four document specifies a lot of the technical specification and all of them have security completely embedded in it. So to answer your question, it is both. Okay, thank you Orlando for sharing this highly informative presentation. We believe that attendees had the chance to learn um, new things today and I suggest you to take time and see our future webinars that we will be hosting. Next Wednesday we will host a webinar topic uh, which is called uh, Implementing a Cybersecurity Framework from ISO 27032 to ISO 55001. Uh, uh, you can also take time and visit our website www.pcb.com on the webinar section to register for our future webinars. Thank you once again and hope to meet you soon in our future webinars. Alright, thank you. Thank you.